Hi, you've tuned into Honey Calarius Midday Musty Show. And as promised, I have the most fascinating person that I've met. His name is David Kalowski. He's from Australia and he's been living in Mount Apple for 22 years. He's a carpenter by trade, a self taught musician, and a gifted artist. Oh, hello, David. Hello. <laughs> David, what is this with this smile? Where do you get this amazing million dollar smile from? I don't know. It just was there. <laughs> it's been there for a long time. I would call it natural peace, natural joy, natural bliss. Beautiful, David. David, I'm here sitting in your beautiful accommodation in the middle of Mount Abu. And can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Because I know you've been living in India for 22 years. You follow the Brahma Kumari teachings. Just can you tell me a little bit about yourself, please? Um, yeah, well, I've been following this for, yeah, 30, 33 years or something now, Brahma Kumaris, but I guess sort of, um, my history before that was, um, I set off to travel around Australia as a working holiday, uh, being a carpenter, a newly ap apprentice and, and tradesman. And my dream was actually to travel around Australia. I had a transit van as my mobile home, surfboard, as we do in Australia, surfboard, tent, trailer, all the tools and that. And um, I ended up in the Kimberley in the northwest of Western Australia. And up there is a very, very remote place, but um, very special as well. So I um, actually, I, and I come across Brahma Kumaris actually in that place. And that was... Um, through one, only one particular BK used to visit that place every year. And, um, and he found the little hut I was living in on this, uh, on this remote beach front. And, um, and I'd just been actually experimenting painting with the airbrush. I was very inspired with the airbrush and, and I painted this big, uh, eight pointed star and, uh, and this, Brahma Kumar, uh, uh, and part of this, um, meditation is his point of light. So he saw this picture I was painting. He said, do you know what you're painting? And, um, and I said, well, I had the experience of this light of this point, uh, eight pointed star. So he started sharing the knowledge of Raj Yoga. Wow, that's amazing. Sometimes they say you're just meant to be at the right place at the right time and there's a calling of some sort and it seems like that's what's happened to you. And you mentioned you were in a remote place in Australia and yet a Brahma Kumar <laughs> ended up being there speaking to you. And what was it about the Brahma Kumari's teachings that, you know, was made you attracted to find out more? Well, actually, from that, that time, that was, I think, in 1984. In 1982, I, I, I was up in that area in the Kimberley and I met this like a sadhu or a hermit, as we say in Australia. Uh, and he was uh, living right up in a place called the Buccaneer Archipelago in the Kimberley. And I got invited to this place and uh, it was a two-day boat trip. And it was like adventure, exploring, and this this particular part of the the land, the Kimberley, is very much uncharted in that time, in the early eighties. And um, so I took the offer to go up to this place, and I went up there, and I ended up, well, I was thought I was going for one week, and I ended up spending one year there. Wow. And I lived, I built a place off the cliff out of out of logs and trees, and um, and I lived in this place for one year like that, no clothes for one year. I was totally with the nature and all the animals and, and it was in that one year I had many experiences which were actually related, very much related to the knowledge of, of Raj Yoga, to Brahma Kumaris. So that, of course, two years later, when this BK visited this place actually called Broome, and when he was sharing this knowledge, it was things I'd already experienced two years before. So it was just like a very easy flow into um, the meditation. That's amazing because they say that <clears throat> in spiritual life, <clears throat> In spiritual life, you always, uh, you're prepared and there's a calling and you're actually called, souls are called and they're meant to be at certain places to grow and develop further. So sometimes there's preparation time as well. And this seems like your training period. <laughs> and it's wonderful that you're a carpenter, that you could literally live and create your own accommodation. And you mentioned the hermit or the saint or whoever was there. Uh, was, were they from an uh, Asian background, Western background? No, he was actually an Australian, but he had a very interesting history. He actually 
Um, if people asked him, he'd say he was a Sikh. He wore this like a fez type hat. He had this long beard, and um, and he'd had he'd been out in this place for about eight years, and just a little bit. He he was there. He said one time he was there for nearly three years that no one actually he didn't have any visitors for th for three years, and when somebody did come eventually, because this place was very difficult to get to, he literally had to go touch them to see whether they were actually real or not because he had a lot of practices in his meditation and astral traveling and many different things which I was fascinated with at that time. Um, but he, his experiences, what he shared, were quite amazing of that, being in that sort of place and having these different practices, which um, I was very inspired with at that time. Have you yourself tried astral travels and uh, uh, various telepathy types of feats? Um, I did a little bit there. I mean, uh, a lot of the things I, I didn't go so far in, um, but I was still fascinated with. But, of course, my experience there was like I really felt there was a intelligence or a being or something that was guiding me because um, as things unfolded there, the thing with meditation, with um, focusing, uh, also with what I needed physically, what I needed to survive with and what I really needed. I, I got right down to the point where, you know, like if I had one mouthful more of food than what I needed, I would get a very clear sign that that was outside this natural law, which I felt at that time was like surrendering to this truth or silence in silence. Because it was like, and this went on for sort of maybe three, four weeks or, or more, where I every time I'd prepare food and, and sit down and eat. Um, and, of course, when I first went up to this place, all the yummy food I brought and all that, I finished very quickly. I had no control of what, you know, like this, of the taste and, and things. And, of course, this hermit that was there, he had so much discipline because it was so difficult to get food there that whatever he got there, he was, he'd ration out. And he'd, you know, have two of these every three days or, you know, like he'd really, and he had that discipline and I was fascinated with that and very inspired because I had no discipline at that time. So, and, um, and when this, I had this experience of this, this thing of eating, um, <clears throat> of course, I thought, wow, there's like something is guiding me. But not only that, but just before that experience, I, I, I did my first painting of this golden temple and this temple is on a piece of plywood. And it was almost almost like the shape of the Taj Mahal with his five doorways and this minuet and other minuets. <clears throat> and I put these five rainbow colors coming out of these five doorways to a, an eye, like an all-seeing eye. Because I felt then it was like this all-seeing eye or this intelligence. And anyway, when I did this painting, um, these five sort of rainbow colors were representing the senses. Because this, this hermit at the time, he said to me, he said, if you master these five senses, that's, that's the aim of the game, which he'd understood. So I, of course, was nowhere near mastering the senses, but I did this painting. And when I put this painting on the handrail of the log platform I built, about three meters away, there's a very clear image of somebody sitting in meditation in the middle of that temple. But I only painted the temple. I didn't paint any person in it. So it was a very clear sign of this person sitting, white hair, white moustache, sitting half lotus position. And I, and I was fascinated. And of course, I, I thought, who is this, you know? And I think it was about probably two weeks before that experience, I read this book, Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda. So in that book, and of course, some of the stories for me at that time, were fascinating and I thought, is this really real or are they just telling these stories of people with occult powers and city powers and all this? And, and anyway, I thought maybe this picture in the temple was one of these people from that book because it had many photos in it and um, black and white photos of different saints and sages. And I, I remember going down to the hermit's camp, getting the book, coming back up the house and looking at this picture of this temple to see if any of those pictures matched this. And, of course, it wasn't. There was none in there that looked like that. And, of course, after that was the experience of this thing with food, of this um, how much I really needed. And, of course, it, it showed me that it was like a feeling if I surrendered to this truth in silence, whatever I needed physically would be provided, like, like this real guarantee. And it was like 
really, really loveful experience as well. It was like, I thought, how simple is that? Like, whatever you need is provided as long as you keep in that space. And um, and I had the same experience with the nature as well, like even clearing the path down to the spring, down to the, I had a rock pool as a, a bath and this waterfalls coming in this rock pool. Um, I remember even clearing a little bit the, the nature and um, even if I cleared more than what I needed to get down, I felt that was like a violation of the needs as well. Like if I needed this much to get to the spring, if I, when I cleared, cleared more, I found that that was also affected mentally as well. It was like some out of alignment, in a sense, with nature. So that was interesting. And of course, this went back before this time, too, in 1982. In 1981, I was actually called up for Aboriginal initiation in another town. And I had the experience of like this presence or this... Um, like bodiless soul come into me and it really scared me at the time because I didn't know what was happening. I was lying down in a Aboriginal's house actually and um, and the next morning this um, my friend's partner, this Aboriginal girl, uh, when I shared this experience with her she said you've been called up for initiation and what how they determined that was when she went out of the house in the morning there was this big, in Australia we had these big lizards called the goanna so that was sitting on the back doorstep and she's, and that's a sign of the spirit. And when I shared this experience, she said, and connected the things together, she said, you've been called up. And of course, I did. I thought at the time, well, I'm not Aboriginal. Um, I didn't think that much of it. But of course, the next year, I ended up up in this place in the Kimberley. And that particular place is actually a sacred site of theirs, the Aboriginal being because of the fresh water, the fresh water spring. Okay. So it was very special in that sense. So, <clears throat> so the Aboriginal um, initiation took place, yes. did it? Yeah, so part of that, which all this I worked out later, at that time I didn't know that. I wasn't sort of aware of that. I was there and this was initiation. But part of their initiation is actually going out into the bush and spending a, a, a long length of time in the bush, in the nature, and how you handle that, how you handle that spiritually. Wow. So, so again, the training ground of your spiritual growth, because sometimes uh, you mentioned that before you met BK, um, there was this two years that you were away, you were staying alone, it was two to three years, um, and all these things happened during that time, did they? Yeah, it was actually it was actually a full year I spent out in the, in the Kimberley like that, and then when I come back, of course, I was so inspired um, uh, because I started airbrush painting. I remember sending down to Perth, which was like 1,500 miles away from where I lived, and uh, getting a little compressor, an airbrush, and I started doing these painting little illustrations. And mainly, most of them were of my experience of that time in the Kimberley, that one year. Uh, about a year and a half, I did. I was supported by the government, and I went into the actually social security in a, in that particular town and said to them very honestly, "I'm not interested in carpentry. I want to learn this airbrush work. I'm living way out of town, like 15 kilometres along the beach in this little hut I built. Um, can I still get unemployment benefits?" And they said yes. So I didn't have to sort of pretend I was looking for work or anything. I could go in every two weeks, I'd go into the village, get supplies, food supplies, come out to this property, beautiful property I was staying on, and then I'd, I'd just paint. So I spent a year and a half doing that, and all the pictures I painted had this image of light in it, because I had the experience of that point of light, almost like um, when I was in the Kimberley, it was, I remember one, the, the experience was a full moon, and, you know, as you know, out in the nature, in the full moon, Without electric lights, everything is so bright and yeah. clear. So all the rocks in this particular valley, and I remember looking at one rock on the side of the cliff, and it was like it was lit up like one of these salt rocks. You know the yeah, yeah so salt rocks yeah, we have, crystal rock. yeah, crystal rock. And I was looking at this rock, and it was about eye level across the other side of the valley on the cliff, and um, and the moonlight was coming through the tree above my head through the and. Um, and I had this experience of these two lots of light meeting from this light in front of me, this rock glowing to, to the, in the middle of the forehead and this light from the moon meeting at this point in the middle of my head. And the experience was like of I was eternal, the feeling of eternity, that, and there was no beginning, no end. And this whole 
feeling that um, this whole thing is just a game we're playing and that, of course, to master the game. And so the next day I climbed up this cliff face to this rock and when I got to it, because I was fascinated that night how this rock was glowing, I got to it and it was almost like a mirror flat surface, very in a hard granite rock and probably about eight foot diameter. And, uh, and I end up, I had two tins of paint, a red and blue tin of paint, and I painted this as this big red dot and this blue circle around, around this dot. And that used to become my meditation. So I'd sit in, at evening, I'd sit in the place where I'd built off the cliff and look at the other side of the cliff. And, and, and that was my, and having these thoughts of myself as this immortal being, this image of light, you know, eternity. So I did that for months. Right. Of course, when I that when I come back after two years, and when uh, BK started sharing knowledge of this Raj Yoga, of course the main thing was this thing of soul being this image of light and being immortal, being eternal, this whole sort of game. So I'd already been touched on that really strongly. So it was like it was like I just flowed into very easily, you know. Wow. So that light is very important because, you know, the meditation is based on um, concentrating on the point of light, also to appreciate the fact that we are divine beings, uh, we're pure, and we just need to bring that out, the div- divinity in us. So can you tell, and tell me a little bit more about the teachings of Brahma Kumari? What was it that really attracted you? And, you know, what are the kind of teachings that you learned from that moment onwards? Um, well, I learned the, the, the early morning meditation was um, uh, very important. And, and I remember sort of, it was funny at the time, because most time when people, when the BKs apparently give the course, and of course when it comes to the meditation time, you know, getting up at four o'clock in the morning is like, a real downer, you know, <laughs> initially because, you know, they, what, you know, I'm already getting up at this time to get up another two hours earlier or something. But I remember at the time, my favorite time for painting was like for midnight, especially in the summer, because it's Kimberley is extremely hot. It's the really hot part of Australia. So it's like almost, you could say the hottest places in India in summer. And you, you know, you know, if you know what that's like, it's like, you know, in the daytime, it's like, Nothing happens much in the evening when the sun goes down, everything comes to life, you know, yes. with out of the heat. So this place was like that. So even though I lived in a very natural area and trees and a beautiful area, um, I used to sleep in the day and then I used to paint all night. So my meditation at four o'clock in the morning, I used to just stop for 45 minutes because I'd paint right through to sunrise. So I'd put a, a candle in front of me. I'd put a book in front of the candle so I didn't see the candle. And then on the woodwork, I'd put a chrome thumbtack and, and the candlelight would reflect off that like this really nice point of light. And I just focus on this point of light just at about, just below eye level. And I think it was like, you know, as everything when we do that, when we, when we're so inspired. And of course, for me, it was like I'd had the experience, but now it was like in black and white. It was in written out in knowledge. And as I was reading the, reading this knowledge and parts of it, and of course, in the meditation, I remember being so focused in the meditation, concentrated, that sometimes it was almost like a long length of time without even a thought about anything. It was just emerged in this point of light. And looking at this supreme being as this point of light and, and the soul being this point of light, like no difference in size, same point, light energy, but... A different part in that sense of different part to play so I remember at a very sh- very short space of time it was like things that used to come to me situations or uh, things which used to affect me um, just wouldn't affect me anymore so it was like a real feeling that something in this meditation connected with this point I was changing and it was very clear by what what things I wouldn't react to or would react to previously and and after that experience in a short space of time so i just continued with that so when you saw this change take place within yourself um do you find that it could be with